Welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron. This is Tucker and Scott. And today we're talking about the rapture. All right. So in this episode, we're talking about the rapture, um, the doctrine that is taught as the rapture. Um, so it's episode six and we get a lot of questions, you know, that people ask us when they watch season one. And one of those I got a couple of times was what about premillennialism and specifically the topic of what is the rapture? And so we're not going to really have time to touch on all of premillennialism. We'll put a lot of resources for that on um, the podcast resource page that you can find on the GBN website or on our link tree. Mm-hmm. Um, but this video, we're going to focus, we'll touch on some aspects, but we're going to talk about what is the rapture. So Scott, like um, what is, what is the rapture? Well, so the rapture in popular, you know, quote unquote Christian culture is the idea that there's going to come a day where all the faithful people towards God, the people mm-hmm. who are faithful towards God, mm-hmm. are going to suddenly disappear. Mm-hmm. And then there's going to be those other people who aren't left behind. Mm-hmm. And that's where the the book series and the mm-hmm. movies that have been made mm-hmm. get their title. The Left Behind focuses on those people who didn't make the rapture. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, obviously it's a part of a doctrine, a, a collection of doctrines called premillennialism. Mm-hmm. And they teach that there's a period of time after that event mm-hmm. that those who are left behind are going to go through a tribulation and things like that. So mm-hmm. when most people say rapture, that's what that's they're kind of they talking about. Now, there's some different flavors of that, yeah. but but that's generally it. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I remember growing up in high school, you know, I'm 36, so I graduated high school in 2003. And um, I remember in high school, someone basically saying, have you read this Left Behind series? And I mean, I went, I, I was a member of the church when I was, you know, I was, well, I was younger, mm-hmm. but I didn't know my Bible very well. So I remember reading these books and being like, man, I didn't know this was in the Bible. And basically what I found out later is a lot of that was really like, it was for me as a work of fiction based off mm-hmm. passages that they think teach it. And so we're going to discuss that today. But like if you're driving and you see a bumper sticker that says something like in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned or something like that. That's kind of the idea. And like the Nicolas Cage movie that he made recently that was called Left Behind. Is that what it's called? Uh, where he was like I in an so. he was like in an airplane and like the pilots disappeared or whatever like that's what people try to paint of what would happen and of course the movie's popular because it's like a really like I don't know extreme like terrifying but you know Battle of Armageddon because it's certainly yeah, fanciful yeah yeah it, it, and it's 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 different and yeah. so that's what we're gonna look at today is you know. <clears throat> The people that believe it, I mean, just honestly, we don't believe there's going to be a rapture. Um, we There's some people that have what they call it pre-trib, which is they're going to, the rapture is going to be before the tribulation. They have mid-trib, which means there's going to be a seven-year great tribulation as they teach, and the tribula- or the rapture will happen in the middle. And there's different, like you said, different flavors. Um, we don't hold to any of those, but we're going to kind of exa- show you at least what we think is the history of it and what the passages talk about. Um, so let's go about the, the history. Like, what about the word? Some people say is the word in scripture. The word rapture is not in scripture. The word rapture comes from a Latin word, which means basically to seize or to snatch. But I don't really like using that argument because you could say like, well, the word, the Trinity is not in scripture. It's like, well, technically the New Testament's in Greek. So like even Godhead is not in Eng- the English word is not in there. So if yeah. some translator translated it, you could say, well, it's in my Bible. So it's really a better way to examine a doctrine is to say, mm-hmm. is the concept in scripture? Um, so that's what we're going to look at. Um, what are some things, I mean, premillennialism, let me try to summarize it really quickly. That teaches that Jesus was sent here to be a king on earth, that the Jews rejected him, even though like John six fifteen, they took him to make him king and Jesus passed through the middle. Pilate said, are you a king? And Jesus said, yeah, John eighteen thirty six. my kingdom's not of this world. Jesus never wanted to set up an earthly kingdom, right? But the teaching of premillennialism is he tried, he failed. The church was plan B. So we're basically in this like, you know, dispensation of the church. And later there's going to be a rapture, a seven year tribulation. They call it the great tribulation, the battle of Armageddon. And then they say off a misinterpretation of Revelation 20, Jesus is going to come to earth and rule for a thousand years. That's where millennia, <coughs> a thousand pre-millennial before the thousand year reign. Before it, yeah. yeah. So that's pre-millennialism and, and the rapture is a part of that. Um, so let's talk about the history of uh, the rapture. Um, I did a lot of research on this. So, even though I was talking, I guess I should probably just, so I, mean, I give you guys my notes sometimes, but yeah. Okay. So it was really invented in the 19th century. So if you want to go back in, that, that means 1800s. If you want to go back and look, um, some people, and I'm going to be generous. Some people say that there was a, a Pentecostal revival in Scotland and a 15 year old girl 
named Margaret McDonald claimed to have this vision. And that's where it started right now. People who hold the rapture um, make a case that this didn't come from this girl's vision. And let's just be let's just be fair and say, OK, let's say it didn't come from this girl's vision. You can still really trace it back to this guy named John Darby. And he basically came to the U.S. and founded the Plymouth Plymouth Brethren denomination. Right. So when he comes to the U.S., he brings this teaching. He really starts to, like, make it, uh, I guess, really popular. And he met a guy named Dwight Moody. Mm -hmm. Now, Dwight Moody set up a big Bible college, Bible Institute in Chicago called the Moody Bible Institute, right? So that's really like the big group that starts spreading this idea of the rapture and premillennialism around the world, right? So right. Darby to Moody, and then Moody sets up in Chicago. Um, from there, you had a guy named C.I. Schofield who worked under Moody, the guy that set up the Bible Institute. He moved to Dallas, and he referenced a... Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. In that Bible, that's where he started adding stuff like footnotes and even like heading titles into the Bible, right? And notes that taught it. So for instance, like he would go and put a, a heading like in Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians, and the heading above the text would say, Jesus teaches about the rapture. Well, if you're a regular guy reading the Bible or girl, and you don't realize that that part's not inspired, but that a guy who published your Bible, just stuck it in there. What are you going to see it and think? Yeah. You're going to be like, well, that's it's true. scripture. Yeah. It's inspired. It's in my Bible. Mm -hmm. Even the footnotes at the bottom. Wow. It's talking about the rapture. So some people don't quite understand that a lot of things that's not in the text, like, okay, I'm looking at first Thessalonians four, a brotherly and orderly life, right? Some guy just decided to put that there. Right. So that could say something that was wrong. You know, the comfort of Christ coming. Well, some people there would put the rapture. So Schofield started this really big movement with this study Bible, right? And says things like Jesus predicts the rapture. And so a lot of people think it's in there. Well, he then, Schofield's student, founds the Dallas Theological Seminary in the 20s, which is a big seminary in Dallas. And lots of graduates go on to be Baptist seminary presidents at other places. And so like, I think maybe Jerry Falwell from Liberty, I think. went. So you have this, it starts over here, it comes to Chicago, it goes to Dallas, and then you have these big groups teaching it and their guys going out everywhere. So when you look at the history of it, you can really trace it back like 200 years. Yeah, it's actually pretty simple to trace it back. Yeah, it's really simple, and it's 200 years. It's and so, new. yeah, I've even heard some of the quotes that they claim early Christian writers, you know, were referencing. And I look up those quotes and read them. That contextually, that's not talking about that. It's talking about the second coming is <laughs> imminent, but it says nothing about a secret rapture. So, what we really want to do, I mean, another problem is big guys like. John MacArthur and stuff, denominational people are pushing it now. I've watched videos of him and others talking about it, which doesn't help because now most people that are in the denominational world look to someone like him and they think, well, if he believes it, it must be true, right? So what we want to do is we want to look at um, the biblical support for it in some of the passages. Um, the first passage we ought to go to, um, I think is really important, is 1 Thessalonians 4, because this is a passage that a lot of people like say is the the one of the rapture texts and so to recap they believe the rapture is like if it happened right now and me scott and tucker if we were saved we would disappear our clothes would fall to the seat and then the great tribulation would start so let's go to first thessalonians chapter four um, the context of thessalonians two is there are some christians who had died they were faithful they died and the christians living were worried they were going to miss out on the resurrection that's sort of the context of first thessalonians four and so, um, Tucker, you want to read, uh, read, um, verse 15 and 16. I was going to say real and fast, 17. the, I think there's a pattern that's going on in yeah. this season that yeah. it, whether it be dinosaurs or it be like Satan's lies, it's just like, um, different information getting spread out in the world and people follow it. Yeah. Like different beliefs about dinosaurs and all that yeah. stuff when it comes to the rapture, it's kind of reminded me of the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so Read 15 through 17. All right. Four. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So us a living, we're not gonna we're not gonna precede those saints who died in Christ. Mm -hmm. Like they've been buried, but something's gonna happen to them when Christ returns. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, angel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then when then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. 
Okay, so verse 16. Mm -hmm. Thanks for reading. Yeah. For the Lord himself, okay, that's talking about obviously Jesus, will descend from heaven with what? A shout, yeah. the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God. Okay, that's not quiet, all right? Uh, no. I've heard people say, well, that only the saved are going to hear it. The text doesn't say that. The text says it's going to be loud. I heard someone say it's one of the loudest verses in the Bible. So it's not going to be some secret thing. When the Lord descends, we're going to look at other passages that line up to show that this text is talking about the final coming. When Jesus returns, he's coming back with his angels. And if you're not saved, there's no second chance after that. That's right. right. So it says the trump, the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, you know, Tucker, you're worried if you're in the first century about your grandma who died faithfully. Yeah. What's going to happen to her at the resurrection? She's Paul gonna says fall. she's going to rise first. Mm -hmm. All right. So she's going to rise first. The dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17. Then we who are alive, the faithful Christians, we, Paul's writing to, to Christians in Thessalonica, who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So he says, comfort one another. So what he's saying is, look, there's going to be a trumpet, a shout. The dead in Christ are going to re resurrect. And then you're going to rise with them. And you're going to go and be with the Lord, right? That's not a secret, quiet, like coming. Mm. That's the, okay. The other thing about the pre-trib rapture is that they say when that trumpet, that starts, the rapture starts the seven-year period, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at this. Go, um, go to, someone look up 1 Corinthians 15. One of you guys. Someone look up 1 Corinthians 50 through 54. 1 Corinthians 50. Because we said there's going to be a trumpet at that what, first Thessalonians. What chapter? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> 50 through 54 is a section. Let me see which verse would help to read. Um, 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, re read verse uh, 51, 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We all shall not sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the last trumpet. So Christ descends, there's a trumpet. And this says at the last trump, what happens for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Okay. So whenever the trump sounds, the shout of a voice angel, Jesus returns. Okay. Visibly revelation one seven says all eyes will see him. Right. Um, even those who pierced him. So, the dead raise first. Those who are living and alive, that day Christians, will rise with them, meet the Lord in the air. That's when we'll be changed, the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians. Tucker, look up John. Sorry to give this to you last second. Look up John 5, 28 and 29. And you look up John uh, 6, 54. So that's when the resurrection happens, okay? Actually, do you have John 6, 54? Read that first. So which day does the resurrection happen? He... That eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The last day. So the last day is when the resurrection occurs. That's whenever the Lord descends with a shout. The trumpet sounds 1 Corinthians 15, and we're all changed. And then you read, when the good, the good are resurrected, who also is resurrected? Read John 5, 28, 29. It says, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So it says the good and the evil are resurrected at the same time, same resurrection. Uh, Acts 24... 15 says the good and evil resurrected uh, on the same day, right? It's one resurrection, right? So you have the same day, yeah, the both same of time. The just and unjust. Is that Acts 24 yeah. or 15? Yeah. 5, 15. 15. Uh, 15. Okay, just and the unjust. They're resurrected <clears throat> on the same exact day. Mm -hmm. That's what you find throughout Scripture. And this is what 2 Thessalonians 1 says. So 1 Thessalonians talks about the dead are resurrected, those living Christians meet them in the air. What about the people who are evil who've been resurrected? but aren't in the air. Second Thessalonians chapter one, it's a terrifying passage, verse seven, to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and admired among all those who believe. So you basically have all these passages put together. Why is it comforting? Why do you think it's comforting to think, well, I hope I make the rapture, but if I don't, then what? You get a second chance. Yeah. If the rapture was real. 
you get a second chance. It's like, well, if, if I missed out on it, then I know the tribulation will be bad, but I'll have a second chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I look in scripture, I don't see anybody get second chances. I mean, as far as like, the, like look at Luke 16, right? The rich man and Lazarus. In that chapter, the, the second part of that chapter, the rich man dies and he's in torments. And what does he want to have sent back to his brothers? Well, he he wants to go. He's right? like, let me or Lazarus, or someone, send, Laz- send Lazarus, send somebody. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Send right. Lazarus back to tell my brothers. And Abraham says, no. No. If they won't hear Moses and the prophets, because he's living under the law of Moses. So he basically says, look, you don't get a second chance. Yep. He says, send back. He's like, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, if they don't hear the law that God gave them under that covenant, which they're under the law of Moses at that point in Luke 16, they, they, that's all their, that's their chance. So for us, it's like literally somebody dying and saying, please give me another chance. And like, well, you got the scriptures, you got the new Testament. Yeah. It's exactly like that. I I guess, um, it reminds me a lot of the attitude that they had then they're looking for another sign for Mm -hmm. someone else. Mm -hmm. So it's like. What God has done is not enough. Yeah. It's not good enough. Yeah. It's not going to be enough. Yeah. And they want that opportunity, that second chance, that that sign that a wicked and adulterous generation is looking for. Yeah. It's kind of like that in a lot of ways because they're saying, well, there's going to be the rapture. And you know what? Everybody else, they're going to get this special thing. Mm-hmm. Like what God's already done, what he's already taught in his word and everything, it's not enough. They need something special. They need to see everyone disappear. Mm-hmm. And then they need to look and say, oh, oh, okay, I understand what's going on I now. I missed it, but I'm going to And that's what's to, portrayed in yeah. these movies and these books. It's yeah. like the people they know disappear, and all of a sudden the main protagonist to whoever has a wake-up call, and they've, they've found that sign that they really needed to actually believe because the scriptures were never enough for them. And it's funny, the people that demanded a sign, first of all, Jesus said a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But he said, no sign will be given them except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he's basically saying, you want a sign, you're not gonna get one except the resurrection of Jesus. And if that's not good enough, I don't know what it is. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network, or GBN for short. You can hop on the App Store, search Gospel Broadcasting Network, and you can download the app. And there's this show, many other great shows that you can watch or listen to and uh, start learning more about the Bible and uh, why we're here, what our purpose is. Thanks for listening. Go to Matthew 24. Because there's a lot of texts, like I know that um, that Darby used texts from like Jeremiah that in context, we're not talking about a rapture or anything like that. They were talking about Israel getting ready to go into Babylonian captivity, right? Judah going to Babylonian captivity. Um, but Matthew 24 is one that I hear people talk about all the time. And so we're not going to have time to go through the whole chapter, but we will have a resource on the podcast resource page going through this whole chapter detail uh, verse by verse. But let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Tucker, read, um, here's the context. Jesus goes out east of Jerusalem through the Garden of Gethsemane probably and then up onto the Mount of Olives. He's looking back, which would be to his west, and he's looking at the temple, the Jerusalem temple. And they're going to ask him about these beautiful buildings. And Jesus says they're going to be destroyed by the Romans in AD 70 is pretty much what he says. And we'll put some passages together. But they basically say, wow, when the temple is destroyed, that must be the end of the world. And Jesus is saying, no. There's going to be, I'm going to answer two questions. I'm going to answer when the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem will be. And then I'm going to give you another answer as to when the end of the world will be. And there are two different answers in Matthew 24. So Tucker, read 24, one through um, three. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all of these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Okay. And so the rest of this chapter, verse 6, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. I hear people quoting this all the time on prophecy and YouTube videos and Instagram and posting like photos of wars and rumors of wars. Go all the way down, okay? We're not going to read it. Go all the way down to verse 33 and 34. Jesus gives you all of these things to watch for. I say you. I'm talking about if you're a first century Christian. Mm -hmm. He gives you all these things to watch for. And then after all these signs, wars, false prophets, earthquakes, famines, all this stuff, listen to what he says. Read verses 33 and 34, Tucker. 
So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this gener- generation, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Okay, so in verse 33 and 34, he says all the stuff I just discussed. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, that means 40 years. If you look at like Art and Gingrich, the Greek, Genea, those living at a given time. Mm -hmm. That word means those living at a given time. He says, in your lifetime, the people I'm talking to, in your lifetime, in the next 40 years, what's going to happen? This generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. The things he just got done explaining. Mm -hmm. So when you go back and look at like Matthew 24, 15, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, that's talking about slaughtering a pig in the Holy of Holies, right? And go study the book of Daniel if you want. When you look at stuff like um, the verse 21, for there will be a great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, no, nor ever shall be. That's Old Testament language. You see it in Ezekiel chapter 5, 8, 9, Joel 2, 1 through 3. What he's saying is for you people living, there's never going to be anything like it in your lifetime. It's going to be awful. If you read what Josephus wrote about what they did, they talk about mothers ate babies. They were so starved by the Romans. They talked about how the, the Jews would eat gold. And Josephus talks about how they tried to sneak their gold by the Roman soldiers. And the Roman soldiers found out they had gold in their stomachs. They start cutting them open, gutting them to find this gold. It was a horrible time, but it was talking about AD 70. That's why Jesus said, when is this temple going to be destroyed? In your generation. Yeah. Right? Now, they also ask, when's going to be the end of the age, the end of time? Right? Look at verse 36. So verse 34, he says, in your generation, then verse 36, he contrasts it. Read verse 36, Tucker. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. Okay. In Mark 13, uh, 30 through 32, Jesus says, not even the son. So he says, basically, of that day and hour, remember the last hour, the last day of the resurrection, John 5, 28, 6, 54, maybe. He says, of that day, the end of time, judgment day. No one knows, not even the angels, but my father only. And then he talks about the days of Noah, all right? And he basically says when Noah was alive, there was Noah who was saved and all these other people who were swept away, right? Mm -hmm. Now, look at verse 40. This is another passage that's used as a proof text for the rapture. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. According to the rapture, do you want to be taken or left? (laughs) <laughs> you want to be taken because taken's good in the rapture mm-hmm. idea and left is bad. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Taken is good in the rapture. In the context, taken is not good. The days of Noah, they, verse 38, the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Look at verse 39. Did not know till the flood came and took them all away. Mm-hmm. The people taken away in this context are those taken away for punishment. Punishment's bad. This does not fit the rapture. It's actually the opposite of the rapture. So like when you look at proof texts like this in scripture that people supporting the rapture put forward, they're just not, they're just not what the context is even talking about. Yeah. I mean, and you know, you gotta, I I gotta point out, you know, to me, the contrast is easy to see easy between the two things he's comparing Mm -hmm. or the the two things he's addressing, not Mm -hmm. comparing. Mm-hmm. He's giving you all the things to look for yeah. leading up to this. Yeah. He's saying, look out for this, 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 and this. This is what's going to happen. These are the things that are going to happen so you know that it's coming. Mm-hmm. And then he immediately says, but of that day, which day? Yeah. The one that you don't have all the signs for. It's like a thief in the night. The one that you don't have all the things for. Yep. Nobody knows. I can't even tell you. That's right. Only the father mm-hmm. knows. That's right. So why would he spend all of that time telling you to prepare, be on the lookout for these things for a day that nobody can know when it's going to come. Yeah. You know, anyway. Mm. Well, you're right, because what Tucker said earlier was really good about people like this because there's like a chance, second chance. Open your Bibles up and read. We don't have time to go to Matthew 25, the parable of the virgins, 10 virgins. When the bridegroom comes, what happens? The door is what? The door is closed. The door is shut. There's no second chance. I mean, um, when Noah, when the floods came and all those people all of a sudden realized Noah wasn't crazy, Mm -hmm. what did they want to do? They want to get in the boat probably. But what happened? God shut the door. Like there was not a second chance. You see that throughout scripture over and over. I mean, and in Matthew 24, just Jesus literally is describing the end of time. He says, it's like the days of Noah. Basically, those people were swept away. Why? Because they waited. They thought maybe they'd get a second chance. They tried to prepare too late. 
and there wasn't there wasn't a second chance. I guess that's the beauty of right now. If you're listening, that you that's have the a, chance right now to. Yeah. This is our second chance in a sense. You have a chance right now to, if you're not saved, to become a Christian. That's right. When when the day does come, whether we die or Jesus comes back, then we won't have that. Yeah, that'll, yeah. Be, that'll be it. And yeah. That was a that's a wonderful way of looking at it, along with the way I was thinking about it earlier. Yeah. People want this tribulation period to be like a second chance, but it's being compared to the days mm-hmm. of Noah, which was what? It was like the first time God wiped out the world. Yeah. And a lot, I mean, it, it, that's what he's he's using here. Yeah. They didn't say, they didn't get a seven year period. No. Yeah. No. Like it, the day came. Yep. Yeah. And they were it. taken away. That was it. The day mm-hmm. is going to come. And, and and in a different sense, you know, the Christians are going to be taken away in a rapture, but everybody else is going to be, I don't know, sent away, whatever. Yeah. But I I think that's that's that's, that's it. And people talk all the time too about the tribulation. If you look in your New Testament, the word tribulation is used about maybe twenty times. I didn't count. So it's, I mean, I know it. I counted sort of. It's around twenty, depending on your translation. It may be more, but it's talking about persecution or sufferings in the first century, their life. Now, you, Jesus said, "You know, blessed are you who are persecuted." All right. Well, that might apply to us. But Jesus spoke over and over about the persecution in the first century. I mean, and and the persecution was called the tribulation. If I remember in Revelation chapter 1, John, Revelation 1, 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation. So John in the first century, right in the book of Revelation, says, I'm in the tribulation. He's being persecuted by the Roman Empire. He's uh, exiled on the Isle of Patmos. Look at the thing he says, in the tribulation and kingdom. The kingdom did come in the first century. Mark 9, 1 said, there are some of you standing here who will see the kingdom come with power, right? In your lifetime, you'll see the kingdom come. Colossians 1, 13 says they've been translated into the kingdom. The kingdom is referenced as the church in the New Testament, right? Um, Matthew 16, 18, uh, you're Peter and upon this rock, I'll build my church and the I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. Yep. So the church, the kingdom did come. Yeah. People are confused. They think, well, Jesus failed. If he failed once, what could... Why couldn't he what? Yeah, fail again. I mean, why not? Yeah, why couldn't they just reject him again? Yeah, and there, and there's a lot of other things we didn't get to talk about. Regarding yeah, so this, much. But uh, you got I binders mean, like this thick. Oh you know? uh, yeah, I've got two. Yeah, I know. And uh, I mean, uh, I mean, just like Jesus sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, yep. reigning, right? Yeah, and it's talked about. Uh, his line would never be allowed to do that. So there's a bunch of different points you could make. Yeah, but and sometimes if you look at like First Corinthians fifteen twenty six or twenty eight. It talks about when the end comes, Jesus delivers the kingdom to the Father. Jesus is ruling right now. He's Lord of Lord and King of Kings, Revelation 19. Yep. I forget what verse. But like Jesus is king right now. He's sitting on the throne of David. And that's what basically Peter says in Acts chapter 2. He's basically saying, look, you know, God said he'd raise somebody up in the Psalms to sit on the throne of David. It wasn't David because you've got his grave right now. It's buried. You can go find his body. He's but he king of spiritual Israel. That's right. Spirit, today. Yeah, Galatians six sixteen. the Israel of God is the church. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's one of the ideas that's, that's kind of misunderstood too. So, I mean, we're running out of time, but remember to check out the podcast resource page and we'll give you lots of other stuff to read, to study. If you want to know a question that's not on that page, send us an email, authenticchristianpodcast.com. And uh, we really appreciate you all watching and we'll see you back on the next episode. See you later. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the show today. We'd like to mention you can download these episodes. They are sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network. We have an app available. You can check that out and get answers to life's biggest questions.